Chapter 3 Bertie was born in South Africa in a remote farmhouse near a place called Timberbati. It was shortly after Bertie first started to walk that his mother and father decided a fence must be put around the farmhouse to make a compound where Bertie could play in safety. It wouldn't keep the snakes out, nothing could do that, but at least Bertie would be safe now from the leopards and the lions and the spotted hyenas. Enclosed within the compound were the lawn and gardens at the front of the house and the stables and barns at the back. All the room a child would need, or want, you might think, but not Bertie. The farm stretched as far as the eye could see in all directions, 20,000 acres of belt. Bertie's father farmed cattle, but times were hard. The rains had failed too often and many of the rivers and waterholes had all been dried up. With few wildebeest and impala to prey on, the lions and leopards would sneak up on the cattle whenever they could. So Bertie's father was more often than not away from home with his men guarding the cattle. Every time he left, he'd say the same thing. Don't you ever open that gate, Bertie, you hear me? There's lions out there, leopards, elephants, hyenas. You stay put, you hear? Bertie would stand at the fence and watch him ride out. And he would be left behind with his mother, who was also his teacher. There were no schools for a hundred miles, and his mother too was always warning him to stay inside. The fence. Look what happens in Peter and the Wolf, she would say. His mother was often sick with malaria, and even when she wasn't sick, she would be listless and sad. There were good days, days when she would play the piano for him and play hide and seek around the compound, or he'd sit on her lap on the sofa out on the veranda, and she'd just talk and talk all about her home in England, about how much she hated the wilderness and the loneliness of Africa, and about how Bertie was everything to her. But... They were rare days. Every morning he'd climb into her bed and snuggle up to her, hoping against hope that today she'd be well and happy. But so often, she wasn't, and Bertie would be left on his own again to his own devices. There was a waterhole downhill from the farmhouse, and in some distance away. That waterhole, when there was water in it, became Bertie's whole world. He would spend hours in the dusty compound, his hands gripping the fence, looking out at the wonders of the veldt, at the giraffes, drinking spread legged, at the waterhole, at the browsing in parlour, tails twitching, alert, at the warthogs, snorting and snuffling under the shade of the shingaya tree, at the baboons, the zebras, the wildebeests and the elephants bathing in the mud. But the moment Bertie always longed for was when a pride of lions came padding out of the veldt. The impala were the first to spring away, then the zebra would panic and gallop off. Within seconds the lions would have the water hole to themselves and they would crouch to drink. From the safe haven of the compound Bertie looked and learned as he grew up. By now he would could climb the tree by the farmhouse and sit high in its branches. He could see better from up there. He would wait for the lions for hours on end. He got to know the life of the waterhole so well that he could feel the lions were out, of, out there even before he saw them. Bertie had no friends to play with, but he always said he was never lonely as a child. At night he loved reading his books and losing himself in the stories, and by day his heart was out in the veldt with the animals. That was when he yearned to be. Whenever his mother was well enough, he would beg her to take him outside the compound. But her answer was always the same. I can't, Bertie. Your, further, your father has forbidden it, she'd say, and that was that. The men came home with their stories of the veldt, of the families of cheetahs uh, sitting like sentinels on their kobji, of the leopard they had spotted high in his tree, larder watching over his kill, of the hyenas they had driven off, of the herd of elephants which had stampeded the cattle. And Bertie would listen wide-eyed agog. Again and again he asked his father if he could go with him to help guard the cattle. His father just laughed, patted his head and said, 
It was man's work. He did teach Bertie, however, to ride and how to shoot too, but always within the confines of the compound. Week in, week out, Bertie had to stay behind his fence. He made up his mind, though, that if no one would take him out into the veld, then one day he would go by himself. But something always held him back. Perhaps it was one of those tales he'd been told of black mamba snakes, whose bite would kill you within ten minutes, or by hyenas whose jaws would crunch you to bits of, to bits of vultures who would finish off anything that was left, so that no one would ever even find bits. For the time being, he stayed behind the fence. But the more he grew up, the more his compound became a prison to him. One evening, Bertie must have been about six years old by now. He was sitting high up in the branches of his tree, hoping against hope the lions might come down for their sunset drink, as they often did. He was thinking of giving up, for it would soon be too dark to see much now when he saw a solitary lioness come down to the waterhole. Then he saw that she was not alone. Behind her and on unsteady legs came what looked like a lion cub, but it was white, glowing white in the gathering gloom of dusk. While the lioness drank, the cub played at catching her tail, and then, when she had had her fill, the two of them slipped away into the long grass and were gone. Bertie ran inside, screaming with excitement. He had to tell someone, anyone. He found his father working at his desk. Impossible, said his father. You're seeing things that aren't there. Or you're telling fibs, one of the two. I saw him. I promise, Bertie insisted. But his father would have none of it and sent him to his room for arguing. His mother came to see him later. Anyone can make a mistake, Bertie dear, she said. It must have been the sunset. It plays tricks with your eyes sometimes. There's no such thing as a white lion. The next evening, Bertie watched again at the fence, but the white lion cub and the lioness did not come, nor did they, next, nor did they the next evening, nor the next. Bertie began to think he must have been dreaming it. A week or more passed, and there had been only a few zebras and wildebeest down at the water hole. Bertie was already upstairs in his bed when he heard his father riding into the compound and then the stamp of his heavy boots on the veranda. We got her, we got her, he said. Huge lioness, massive she was. She's taken half a dozen of my best cattle in the last two weeks. Well, she won't be taking any more. Bertie's heart stopped. In that one terrible moment, he knew which lioness his father was talking about. There could have been no doubt about it. His white lion cub had been orphaned. But what if, Bertie's mother was saying, what if she had young ones to feed? Perhaps they were starving. So would we be if we let her go on. We had to shoot her, his father retorted. Bertie lay there all night listening to the plaintive, roaring echoing through the veldt as if every lion in Africa was found in a lament. He turned his face into his pillar and could think of nothing but the orphaned white cub and he promised himself there and then that if he ever the cub came down to the water hole looking for his dead mother then he would do what he had never dared to do. He would open the gate and go out and bring him home. He would not let him die out there all alone. But no lion cub came to his water hole. All day, every day, he waited for him to come, but he never came.